How you doing? IB Nation Sports Talk. We're up. We're rolling. And uh, it's great to have you here, even salty uh, for that matter. But uh, busy week, busy show. This is going to be a little bit different than usual. Uh, we got a lot going on today. Ryan Roberts is going to give us a weekend recruiting update here in a minute. Uh, of course, we've got more bad news out of Notre Dame with Benjamin Morrison's shoulder injury slash surgery that Notre Dame announced earlier today. We're going to be talking about that in rapid fire. Uh, Morrison, of course, is going to miss the rest of the spring. Um, so you've got two important players, Morrison and Riley Leonard, both having surgery uh, just you know within the last few days, let alone a few weeks. But uh, we will lead off rapid fire with the Benjamin Morrison news in a little bit. Notre Dame women's basketball heading to Albany, New York for the Sweet 16 the plane takes off tomorrow. I'll be on it. Irish play Oregon State Friday afternoon at 2.30 in the Sweet 16. And I'll be uh, doing the show from Albany on Thursday night. South Carolina against Indiana will be the second game Friday after Notre Dame's game out there in Albany. And, of course, if the Irish win, they'll be in the Elite Eight for the first time in five years. Sunday afternoon, a um, little controversy with Caitlin Clark. Last night, they held off West Virginia to advance to the Sweet 16 for the second straight year themselves. A lot of grumbling about the calls that uh, Clark and the Hawkeyes were getting. They're actually going to be in Albany as well this weekend. It's a different regional. They've got two different pods of four teams each going on out there, both in Albany and in Portland. So you're going to have a lot of stars, actually, out in Albany this weekend. you got Hannah Hidalgo, Caitlin Clark, Juju Watkins from USC. Paige Beckers from UConn, and we'll touch on uh, her a little bit later as well. The uh, the NFL changing its kickoff rule, USMA 87. Uh, had some, uh, was asking uh, about our thoughts on that. We're saving that for rapid fire as well. So uh, you know, just, a, just a lot of stuff going on, like I said, on today's show. Jesse's going to be here with me for rapid fire in a little bit, we're going to start with the Benjamin Morrison stuff. But uh, Ryan's got a recruiting update for you. We had some scheduling conflicts today, so Ryan had to record this solo. You know, I know that that's going to make a lot of people very happy, the fact that we're playing a recorded segment and it's Ryan <laughs> going solo in there. So uh, you're going to hear from Ryan Roberts a little bit. A lot of great stuff, though, from the weekend, you know, in terms of recruiting update and that whole thing. And then when Ryan is done. Like I said, Jesse is going to be in here with me and we'll be live for rapid fire after Ryan's recruiting update. If I can uh, actually find Ryan's <laughs> recruiting update to play. There it is. Hold it. Is it? Let me see. Oh, there it is. Here we go. IB Nation, Ryan Roberts here, director of recruiting at irishbreakdown.com giving you all a little bit of a recruiting update from this past weekend. As we know, on Saturday, Notre Dame had spring practice, full pads, and also had a long list of talented recruits, both in the 2025 and 2026 recruiting classes that were on campus, on site, to check out everything from practice to tour to sit down with coach, with the coaches, and it was a tremendous event, as it always is, and it has become a very uh, consistent thing under Marcus Freeman to have great unofficial visitors during this time of year, during spring practice. And I wanted to bring you all a little bit of just kind of updates on some of the biggest recruits that were on campus this past weekend. Wanted to actually start off kind of an interesting one because there were six members of the 2025 recruiting class that commits in that class that were on campus. I want to give you guys a little bit of insight from two in particular, because I think that it's going to lead us into some of the obviously uncommitted targets that were on campus as well. So I want to start off with Christopher Burgess, who of course is defensive end out of Chicago, Illinois, Simeon, six foot four, 240 pounds, considered a top 40 player in the 2025 class by rivals. And I also want to throw in a little bit of a conversation around Deuce Knight, Loosedale, Mississippi, George County quarterback, potential five-star recruit in the 2025 class, committed to Notre Dame as well. Had the chance to speak to a few of the commits, but those two were the ones that I really want to focus on because they I th they gave me some great stuff. They really did. So 
First and foremost, Christopher Burgess. First practice, first practice of the year, obviously, for him, being able to check out the team in person, but also his first time back on campus since January when he came for the Notre Dame Junior Day, the first one of this offseason. And it was just really cool to hear because Christopher talked a whole lot about how just being able to watch the practice and see the guys get after it. He talked a little bit about just kind of the chemistry that they're developing, but also the competitiveness that he saw during this one practice. He talked a lot about Coach Washington, talked a lot about Coach Sebastian, who's a defensive line assistant for the team as well, and talked about just kind of the energy that was around them. You know, Coach Wash has been a guy that we have talked about and a lot of people have talked about in the recruiting side of things about just kind of the energy he brings to the table and the excitement he brings as a teacher of young men and obviously a great talented defensive lineman. So they heard a lot of energy was the thing that you kept hearing from Burgess, right? Kept talking about the fact, and, and this was very good because I know some people, anytime a recruit commits as early as, as Chris did, obviously he was a early January commitments to the University of Notre Dame. There's plenty of time until National Signing Day, so people are always going to worry until they're signed on the data line of guys sticking in the class. One of my favorite quotes from Chris was he said, paraphrasing slightly, but almost word for word, that being able to see the practice, see the defensive linemen get after it, see the coaches in action, that it made him feel like he was already a part of the program and that he couldn't wait to finally be a part of it, right? So very just reassuring statement, obviously, for a young man that is committed to the Notre Dame in the 2025 class. He's a Chicago kid who is also, and at the time, picked Notre Dame over a long list of suitors. I mean, you're talking about Alabama. You're talking about LSU. There's been some – Ohio State was obviously a team that was very high on his list, Michigan as well. So you beat him and kept him at home against some of the top programs in all of college football. But just hearing that reassurance every time he comes, it's just always a good thing. It's it's always very positive to see that Christopher just kind of continues to not only come back his second time since committing to Notre Dame at the All-American Bowl in early January, but also just kind of reemphasizing how excited he is to be a part of this class and the opportunity he has in front of him. So which is really cool to hear. And then also I wanted to kind of give you guys some insight from Deuce Knight because I had a long conversation with Deuce and he gave me a lot of great stuff. A, a couple quick updates, up to 213 pounds, which I thought was really cool. I remember talking to Deuce before he committed to Notre Dame and he was about 196 pounds at that point. So my man is, is since, because that was the beginning of his junior year right around, he has put on almost 20 pounds since he's committed to the University of Notre Dame, which is obviously a great sign for physical development moving forward. Apparently, the coaches were joking with him because he had told him, like, hey, guys, like I'm over 210 now. And I think he said Gino Gadouli was the one that was kind of like, eh, I don't see that, man. Where's that weight at? Where's that weight? So they actually got him on the scale on the visit, and he was 213 pounds. So a legit 213 weight at Notre Dame this past weekend. I really wanted to talk about Deuce because one person that is still a person he's getting very familiar with is Mike Denbrock. You know, when he committed to University of Notre Dame, Jared Parker was still the offensive coordinator. He has Gino Gadouli in his back pocket because Tim and Gino have a great a great relationship. And honestly, I don't think that they land Deuce Knight, especially the timing of which, as fast as they did, without Gino Gadouli being as instrumental in that recruitment as he, pos as he was, you know, and throughout and continuing to build that relationship. But Mike Denbrock was obviously not the offensive coordinator at the time. And I know that you're talking about a dual-threat quarterback from the state of Mississippi. Obviously, him seeing LSU this past year, seeing Jane Daniels win a national championship as a dual threat style quarterback, I think that's reassuring. Obviously, I think we can kind of deduce that pretty easily. But ultimately, just hearing Deuce talk about it, he one of the favorite things he had said about Mike Denbrock was, "You meet him, and you just think he's going to kind of be a laid back, you know, just kind of really thoughtful coach, you know, for the lack of a better word." But then he coaches and you're like oh this guy's intense man like he's getting on people's butts in practice and he is really you know getting the energy going and the optimism going but also being a hard coach like he's not an easy coach obviously and and that's something that deuce really gravitates towards he doesn't want a guy that's just rah rah and and you know you're great at everything and there's no faults like he wants to be held accountable he wants to have kind of that layer to it as well so Having Mike Denbrock and developing that relationship, everything is going great with Deuce Knight. I think that he is very, very solidified in his 
commitment to the University of Notre Dame, which is obviously great for all parties included in this. Not only does he get a great education, not only does he be a part of one of the historic programs of college football, but Notre Dame also has a beacon for their 2025 class and one of the more talented quarterbacks they have had in a long time, potentially coming to campus in 2025. So it was really here, cool to hear that reassurance and the energy around the program, but also Deuce, nice enough, was able to give us a little bit of insight into two recruits that I want to talk about now, kind of talking about uncommitted targets that were on campus. First and foremost, the guy that's most, most prevalent to his success is 2025 Las Vegas, Nevada, Bishop Gorman wide receiver Derek Meadows, who – had, was on his return trip and had not been to Notre Dame since last offseason when he camped and got his offer from Notre Dame. Now, for people that aren't too up-to-date on that recruitment, for a long time, it was a Notre Dame-Washington battle. And then, obviously, Washington had the turnover with Kalen DeBoer. And so you're sitting there like, Notre Dame's got the inside track here. Like They're, they're kind of alone for a second, right? And then he goes down to Battle Miami and camps out there and – showcases his talents in front of everyone and here comes Alabama here comes Tennessee here comes a lot of really nice offers coming the way of Derek Meadows University of Florida like a lot of the SEC schools that are now coming in and of course that's going to bring like a moment of hesitation of like man like this is going to be a little harder than we once thought it was going to be I will say this and then I got a couple cool notes from Deuce on Derek as well I will put it like this Notre Dame had to weather the storm of all those great offers coming into him, all those high caliber programs. And I think they did to the degree of, I think Notre Dame has a very good chance when the final decision is made from Derek. I do felt obviously very good about where Derek was with Notre Dame, you know, kind of just how he was reacting and, and how he was loving the, the trip and, his bond that he is for with Derek Meadows as well, along with Jerome Bettis Jr., who was on campus as well. And the those three have been developing a very good relationship. I mean, we've seen very outwardly on Twitter, Deuce, Jerome Bettis Jr., several other recruits tweeting at Derek Meadows, like, you know, missing peace and, and that type of stuff, right? So they know how important Derek is to the class. And it, by all accounts, it appears that they moved the needle with him. And I think that they are continuing to kind of pace this recruitment. Now, the next few weeks, Derek's going to get down to like Tennessee, for instance. He's probably going to get out to a couple other schools. Notre, the, the feeling of Notre Dame needs to keep momentum here, right? And you're if you're Deuce Knight, the rest of the recruits, if you are the coaches and the recruiting staff, you need to continue just letting Derek know. Priority in this class. We need you in this class. We need you in this class. If they do, I think they have a chance to, to land him. And for people that don't know, like Deuce Knight – is right around this more of a cool note. He's between six foot four and six foot five, somewhere in that ballpark. He's a big dude. I mean, we're talking about a kid that's now 213 pounds. He's going to be a really big quarterback. I asked him, I was just kind of joking with him, and I said, you know, who who's taller, you or Derek, right? Because when Derek was offered by Notre Dame originally, I mean, he was probably around the same height, like six four and a half, maybe six five, somewhere in that ballpark. And he was just kind of laughed and said, uh, Derek by a landslide now, like legit six six, legit. So Notre Dame does a good job with, with Derek Meadows, or a really good job with Derek Meadows this weekend. I think that they pace this one right now. Notre Dame has to continue that momentum because he is a priority in this class. He's a guy that since he camped at Notre Dame last offseason has been a player that they've wanted. And now that he's blowing up, it's going to be obviously be a little bit more difficult to land him. But they are in a good spot. It's now just about staying relentless out there, staying relentless, and hopefully they're able to land him in the end. The other recruit that I talked with Deuce about because I know that he had had a great relationship with him is Indianapolis, Indiana, Ben Davis, cornerback, Mark Zachary. And all these updates I'm doing for now are 2025 kids, the next couple specifically. And then we'll talk about 2026 here in a second. Deuce and Mark have a very good relationship. They both play video games a ton. Deuce is constantly talking to Mark just about, you know, the pitch of Notre Dame and wanting to be a part of class and, and, and all that great stuff. Right. Now, do said something very interesting, and it was on the board at boardsirespeak.com. I should have plugged that to begin here because nothing I'm saying here isn't on the board already. And either a the thread I put out from the intel from this past weekend or an update piece on one on these specific recruits, it's all on there at boards.irespeak.com. So you guys should go sign up now if you aren't already because none of this information would be new to you. You would know all everything that I'm saying. 
So how phrased about Meadows was, you know, Deuce felt good about what they did with him this weekend. And they, you know, obviously are building that relationship, continuing to build it, you know, and, and he's hoping that that wins out in the end type of conversation, right? Now, this one where Zachary was, it, it, it was, it was similar in the sense of he had said, you know, same with Mark, like we thought we really did a good job of just kind of showing him that we need him a part of the class and, and, and that he is a priority and he would be great in the blue and gold and, and th that type of pitches. But he said one sentence that I think really stuck out to me and said, I feel really good about that. Right. And this is a player that Deuce is very familiar with a, a player that they've been pushing for, for a long time. So as of today, folks, uh, just simply, and I've been saying this the last few weeks, feel really good about Notre Dame with Mark Zachary. Like they are the team to beat in my opinion. Now he has an official visit or he set up for Notre Dame later this off season. I know that he, you know, like Michigan was a team that has been high on his list for a long time as well. And I don't necessarily would, I wouldn't say coming out of the visit that there's a, you know, decision in the very near future, but I do think that this one is winding down. I do think that Mark Zachary is going to make a decision, you know, relatively, you know, over the next couple months, you know, like sometime over the next couple months is kind of what I would say. And I think that they have really showed that they are the best fit potentially for him. I think he has been very understanding of that pitch. And I think he's been very open to that pitch. And I believe that Notre Dame is the team to beat for Mark Zachary moving forward. And if it ends anytime soon, or just in general, I think Notre Dame is the team to beat. So move the needle, Mark Zachary. Another person that they moved the needle with, but I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily say that they moved it at all right, well, let, let me phrase it this way, okay? Because th that, that was about to be a really, a really confusing sentence. 2025 Santa Ana, California, modern-day cornerback Chuck McDonald the third made his first trip to Notre Dame. Now, Chuck has been on the board for Notre Dame since last pot of gold, before this past year, so 2023 pot of gold. A player that from the start, I believe I had an interview with him like right after the pot of gold or even maybe a little bit before the pot of gold, and Chuck was has been very open that Notre Dame is a team that he is very interested in. They are a team that pitch is very interesting to him as well, and that one that he is going to give a legit chance to moving forward down the road, right? But that's great, and he continuously said that, and he's always spoke volumes of Notre Dame program, but he never visited Notre Dame, right? Like he never got to South Bend and really made it kind of a tangible understanding of like, Hey, this is where I would potentially go to school. I feel great about it. I could see myself here, student life. Just, just that part of it was never something that we have known. Now I would phrase it like this is Chuck McDonald got to, to got to campus this weekend. And again, said all the right things. He really likes Mike Mickens. Got to spend some time with Al Golden, got to spend some time with Marcus Freeman. He said that he could see himself there. He said that he feels like he could be the next line of great corner at Notre Dame, obviously after Benjamin Morrison. Like he thinks that he could be that guy potentially for the University of Notre Dame. Very, very, very high on that outlook. But I would say it like this, guys, is that as of today, how we're looking at this cornerback board is you have Cree Thomas already in the class. You feel good about where you are at Mark Zachary. You feel good about where you are with Florida cornerback Dallas Golden. That would be a three-man cornerback room. Now, there is some interest in exploring a fourth. And Jameer Joseph is a kid that we've talked about recently out of New Jersey. That seems to be kind of the next guy on the list after Devin Williams committed to Auburn. It's, it's kind of it seems like Jameer Joseph is a guy that they're going to continue to push for. Chuck McDonald is an interesting player because I feel like, and it's just kind of me reading between the lines, is that Notre Dame has consistently recruited Chuck McDonald, but he, I don't know if he's ever been a hundred a player that they've hundred percent thought we have a good chance at landing him because again, he had never come to campus before. I'm interested to see now moving forward. If the viewpoint of Notre Dame, and again, speculation on this part, I'm interested to see if Notre Dame opens up their mind a little bit and says, Jameer or Chuck McDonald would be the, the next corner that we want after 
Mark Zachary and Dallas Golden if you get commitments from both those players. I'm interested to see that. I will say that we will know very soon. Either way, because Chuck McDonald needs to take an official back to Notre Dame for Notre Dame to have a legitimate chance. If he doesn't, I just think it was a great visit for him, and he's going to end up playing somewhere else and staying more on the West Coast, and that's fine. It's a great player. But if he scheduled an official visit, that means that there was it, it was real for him, right? Like he could really, really see himself. He says a lot of all the great things, finally get on campus. If he sets an official visit, then I think there's something to talk about here. Otherwise, just a really good visit. And Notre Dame set their stage, obviously, to, to really show him what they can bring to the table. So that's Chuck McDonald, cornerback, 2025, modern day, state of California. Now let's roll through. I have five 2026 players. We're going to go a little faster here because it's obviously super, super early for 2026 kids. Let's start with this player that everyone's going to want to talk about a little bit. And that's Lake Mary. Florida high school quarterback, Noah Grubbs, six foot four, 220 pounds, 215 pounds, depending where you look. As of today, now heading into this visit, I would say that there's probably a three-man list that, of quarterbacks that I feel good about for Notre Dame as far as where they are with those players. Two of them are from the state of Florida. They're actually good friends and train together. One is Noah Grubbs. The other is Brady Hart from Coco in the state of Florida. And then Ryder Lyons out of Folsom, California. Now. The two Florida kids, it's a really interesting dynamic because, one, I believe today we have kind of, again, some intel and some conversation, believe that Notre Dame would take either of those quarterbacks if any of them wanted to come today, right? So they're all takes for Notre Dame potentially, it seems. The question then becomes is that you only have one quarterback in the class. Who wants to come first? And I think that makes things cloudy with Ryder Lions. Because Ryder Lyons is a player that really likes Notre Dame, but he's not in a rush to visit anywhere. He's not in a rush to make a decision. He is letting this process play out. Now, not saying that Ryder Lyons won't end up being the quarterback in the class for Notre Dame. I'm just saying it's less likely, I believe, because I just don't think that he's in as much of, of a, a hurry or pace to make a decision sometime this offseason. I don't think it's necessarily something that he is like, Set on that he needs to make a decision this offseason. Brady Hart and Noah Grubbs are players that have talked about that. You know, I had Brady Hart for an interview where Brady had said that he would like to commit before his junior year. He wants to be early in the process. He wants to be early to a class, and he wants to recruit the heck out of that class. So Brady Hart is on in position that he wants to make a decision before his junior year. Noah Grubbs is in the same boat. But he is also kind of, again, reemphasized that I would like to be early in the class. Once I commit, though, I am committed. So he wants to make sure he has crossed every T and dotted every I. He wants to make sure that there is no stone unturned because once he's committed, he's committed and that's it. Though you don't have to worry about decommitment from Noah Grubbs. It's just over with. And with them being close friends, I would say today is that I believe that Brady Hart and Noah Grubbs are the two most likely players to end up with Notre Dame in the 2026 class. Now, that being said, how is that going to end? Because right now, Brady Hart is set to visit Notre Dame April 3rd. I wouldn't necessarily say he's in commit mode if he has a great visit, but you never know when that happens. There is going to be a very interesting dynamic here because they train together, they're friends. And they both potentially have the number one slot in the quarterback class for Notre Dame. Now, Noah Grubbs had a great visit. And he said something. He said outside of his first visit, technically, this, this offseason was to Central Florida. But that's his backyard, right? It's a very easy trip. His first big visit that he wanted to go to was Notre Dame. Because he has said in the past that Notre Dame has recruited him the hardest. He got there with the snow. Snow doesn't bother him. He really loves the Notre Dame program. I think Notre Dame is a very clear leader for him or one of the leaders for him. You know, a couple of the Florida schools obviously are doing a good job as well. But Noah just got an offer from Ohio State. I'm just curious to see when Noah decides that he wants to make this commitment because he's being pursued by some big-time programs. There's no doubt about it, right? So I think this class, as of today, if I had to make a prediction, I would say Noah Grubbs, Brady Hart are the two most lucky quarterbacks in the class. I think Noah Grubbs had a great visit to Notre Dame. I think that they are going to be very hard to beat in the end, potentially for him, if he does make a decision sometime soon. But does Brady Hart want to pull the trigger quicker? That's the question, and that's what I'm left leaving this 
visit with is to see who wants to be in this class first because i think that the spot will go to whoever wants to pull that trigger before the other two img academy defensive backs i want to talk about real quick one is safety in both 2026 players by the way both is safety one is safety zek fort zechariah fort the other one is kasani giles and i I apologize for pronouncing Kasani wrong. It's K-S-A-N-I, so it might be Sani. Maybe K is, is silent. I'm not 100% sure on that. But Mr. Giles and Mr. Fort both visited this past weekend as well. Actually, I'm sorry. Giles, actually, no. Yep, they both they both visited this past weekend. My apologies. I was getting my uh, timeline off a little bit here. So, Zach Forts. This one's interesting. Because he has been a player that people have known about since his freshman year at IMG Academy. He was the first IMG Academy player, freshman ever, to be main, named a team captain. So he was that guy early on for IMG. And as you can imagine, a lot of big-time programs coming after him, man. Ohio State, all the SEC schools, like everyone is coming after Zek Forts. But this was his first visit to Notre Dame. And I was pleasantly surprised with how high he was speaking of Notre Dame. Like he, high academic kid, he had said to me that one big thing that he wants in a school is he wants a school that can get the best out of him on every side of the coin, not just as a football player, as a student. He wants the full package here, which obviously plays very well into Notre Dame's hands. And not only are you playing high-level football, not only are you at a historical program, but you have high academics and you have obviously the four for 40 and, and the, and the all, everything that comes with being a graduate from the university of Notre Dame, that network, which really plays into their favor. So I think they moved the needle with Zach Forts. I actually think that Notre Dame has put themselves in a pretty good early position there. Now you have to fight against the big boys if you want Fort in the end, but I think that they really did a great job as they did with Kasani Giles, who Giles is a player that, has a little bit of versatility on the back end. He can play all over the place. They were actually selling this to him. Like, you don't have to just be the Benjamin Morrison. You don't have to just be the Xavier Watts, the next in that line. You can be both. They love his versatility on the back end, Mr. Giles. And he really liked that pitch. And he had spoken about that. The staff said, but the net, the rest is up to you, though. Like, you could be that guy. But it's only about the work that you put in and the relentlessness that you bring to the table. And he said, I know I have that ability. I know I have it. So it was really refreshing to hear. It was really cool that Giles just kind of sees the blueprint in front of him, but understands that there needs to be work to put in to fulfill that blueprint ultimately. I think Notre Dame did a good job with both IMG kids. And uh, both players, first time visiting campus, which was big time. Getting them so quickly after the pot of gold offer, I think was very, very good for Notre Dame. A great sign. Now it's about continuing to build that momentum, continuing to build it now moving forward. Two more guys, then we'll get out of here. Elbert Hill, who's a cornerback out of the state of Ohio, Archbishop Hoban. He is a player that was actually offered by Notre Dame last July, right? So, so before his sophomore year, it was after his freshman year, before his sophomore year. They've been on him for a long time. Now, the minute you hear an Ohio kid who Ohio State wants, your mind goes, that's going to be a tough sledding. But I would say this is that Mike Mickens and Marcus Freeman have been spearheading this one with Albert Hill for some time now. And obviously, they're both Ohio guys. Both went to the same high school. And also, Marcus Freeman coached at Ohio State. And, and so they had the Ohio ties in their advantage. And they got on Elbert Hill very, very early. So this was another continuation of Elbert Hills does nothing but speak volumes of Notre Dame. In the end, this feels like, and there's a lot of time, we're talking about kids that just finished up their sophomore year, but this is a young man, Elbert Hill, who I think this is looks like it's going to be a Notre Dame-Ohio State battle in the end. Does the in-state Buckeyes win, or did Notre Dame put in enough, enough big work early to be able to close on him? Regardless, big-time player who Notre Dame really impressed this past weekend, and the last one I want to talk about is Jarius Rogers, who is a pass rusher out of the state of Florida, list from Fleming Island, by the way, listed at six foot uh, six foot five, six six, depending where you look, 190 pounds, 200 pounds, somewhere in that ballpark. Someone asked me about his size and his weight. He looks like a he looks like a high school or college small forward who has still not 
hit the weight room yet, right? Like he, and I know that he works out. I'm not insulting him, but he is a player that is just super skinny and long for days. Now, first trip to Notre Dame was this one. And I see this kid eventually being a 240 plus pound Viper. Like I think he's going to be six, five, six, six, 240 plus pounds with incredibly long arms, big time upside, Jarius Rogers. Now he talked a lot about seeing coach Washington in person, seeing the defensive line get after it, the energy they brought already talking about potentially wanting to come back to South Bend again in the future. This is a young man that is worth keeping an eye on because not a ton of people know about him yet. His offer list is still a little bit small. He's not rated incredibly high by any recruiting platform yet, but keep an eye on it for Jarius Rogers, Viper defensive end pass rusher out of the state of Florida, out of Fleming Island. Folks, thank you all for joining me. I appreciate you for a little bit of this recruiting update. Sean Stiders got you guys the rest of the way, but make sure you go to boardstidersbreakdown.com and we'll be talking recruiting for the foreseeable future. Thank you all guys for watching and enjoy the rest of IB Nation Sports Talk. This is always what happens when I have the pre-recorded segments. I never remember to unmute myself. Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? <laughs> I am ready I for seeing, rapid fire. I was just seeing if everyone was paying attention. That's what it was. You know, that's that's all it was. All right, so Jess, the big news of the day, fill in the blank. Notre Dame announcing today that Irish cornerback Benjamin Morrison will miss the rest of the spring with shoulder surgery, but is expected back for the 2024 season is blank. It is worrisome. And the reason why it's worrisome is you have lost some of your more talented players in terms of spring ball at the quarterback position and now the cornerback position. And the reason why I say Benjamin Morrison is worrisome is it's a shoulder and shoulders always seem to be nagging or lingering and anytime he goes up to make a play or comes down awkwardly now, there is a chance that his shoulder is, is just continuously going to bother him. And so I just don't like this in, in terms of the fact that this could, you know, potentially be a reoccurring injury for as long as Benjamin Morrison plays football. And I, I don't want it to be that, but that's why I, I again, I say it's worrisome is, is it's an injury that doesn't go away. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be a little touch and go because we don't know the specifics. All they said was this is arthroscopic surgery. And that can mean like a million different things, you know, because did they just go in and clean up a little debris or something like that in there? Or is it a full blown labrum tear, which is, you know, the worst case in it, labrum or a rotator cuff for a cornerback. I don't think you would expect it would be rotator cuff, but a labrum tear, which is essentially what, Cam Hart had multiple times and I've torn both of my labrums. It is the, you know, it's like the band that holds your shoulder together. And, you know, they, they, both of them were operated on via the arthroscopic procedure. It basically means they, they make little incisions in your shoulder. There's multiple incisions there. They go in through one incision with the scope so they can look around and see what's in there. And then they go in the other incisions with the, you know, the, the actual tools that they do the procedure with. And, you know, if they have to re repair the labrum or whatever. And again, we don't know exactly what it is, but there are four months until the start of the season. And if it's a, if it is a labrum tear, that's a very, four months is a very short amount of time to recover and get ready to go out there and play again, because they do the procedure. You stay in the immobilizer sling where you can't move your arm for several weeks. And then once they finally take the immobilizer off, you're doing, you start off with very small movements, you know, getting movement back. So you don't have the frozen shoulder and all that kind of stuff. And you can't raise your arm up over your head for even more weeks after that. And then you're finally building it back up. And then you throw football into the mix for a football player, you know? So again, it's a big if we don't know that that's what it is, but if that is what it is, you know, they said he'll be back for the 2024 season. They didn't say he'd be back for the start of the 2024 season. They just said he would be back for the 2024 season. That means he'll be back 
at some point. So, you know, like, of, of course, they're going to put out a tweet that's not going into details with best and worst case scenarios. And so there's there's a lot that's that's, you know, TBD in this, you know, so it's it's not great news. Like you can you know, you can try to paint the picture uh, best case scenario right now, but we don't know exactly what this is going to look like. So there's there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And when you throw this in with the fact that you've got your quarterback, you basically got one of your two best players on the defensive side of the ball, arguably the most important on the defensive side of the ball, based on what he's done for the last two years, leading the nation in interceptions over the last two years. And then you've got your your quarterback on the offensive side of the ball. Those are two very significant injuries and it slash surgeries in a very short amount of time. On a preliminary level, what is more impactful in your opinion? Riley Leonard's injury or Benjamin Morrison's injury? You know, we were talking, and we'll talk a little bit more about the quarterbacks here in a minute. We're going to hear some comments from from Marcus Freeman specifically about Angeli and Kenny Minchie. But the Texas A&M game aside, the next three games after that are pretty favorable. I think, you know, in terms of if you have to go with an inexperienced quarterback, you're going to get home games, you're going to get a couple MAC opponents with Purdue sandwiched in between. The Texas A&M, like just Texas A&M, the team itself, because it's a rebuilding situation for Mike Elko going in, it's the atmosphere, I think, similar to Ohio State that I would right. worry about the most with a guy like Angeli going into that. You know, like I, I would still give Notre Dame a shot, but, you know, a, a good chance actually with Angeli in that game. But not having Benjamin Morrison, I mean, he's literally an All-American candidate. He's an All-American caliber cornerback and a first-round draft pick type cornerback. So that's very significant, I think. I, I might nudge that, you know, again, just for the start of the season, I would I would nudge that, I think, up ahead of, of Riley Leonard because of, of where they are. I mean, now there's good players behind him. You've got Christian Gray and Jade Mickey over on the other side, and maybe Christian Gray comes over to the boundary and, you know, kind of fills in there. But then you've also, hey, you've got to get those other guys ready to go if you're going to go out there and play championship level football. And again, the schedule is forgiving enough in part there at the start of the season where you can, you know, kind of build those guys up and get them ready to go. But there's going to be some question marks because you're going to have a lot of inexperience other than, you know, Mickey, Clarence Lewis, and Christian Gray. I will say, you know, I don't know which side I lean. I, I think right now Benjamin Morrison injury would be more impactful. But, you know, if your if your Chance Tucker or Jaden Mickey or Christian Gray, I mean, now's your opportunity, right? Like this is a tremendous chance for Notre Dame to build depth at the cornerback position, whether or not Benjamin Morrison comes back or not. Best case, he comes back. Everything's fine, but now you have incredible depth and guys that challenged each other all spring and got more reps because Benjamin Morrison is sidelined. Worst case, Benjamin Morrison can't play the first few games, maybe misses half a season, and now you got guys who are prepared, young, and talented, ready to step up behind them. And so it, I know it sucks, but either way, I think it's it's good to, that Notre Dame is going to build depth behind Benjamin Morrison during the springtime now. And I mean – you know, again, you don't want it to happen, period. But if it's going to happen, this is still obviously the better time for it. To, it's much better for it to happen now than in training camp. But again, not knowing the full extent of, of what the injury is, you know, so even if it is a labrum tear, at least it's happening early in spring and early in spring practice. So you can begin to get some of those young guys ready to go. You're You're absolutely right. It's like this is... This is the better time, so you can work on developing some of those guys. Salty said earlier, buy or sell, early returns on the strength and conditioning program. Riley Leonard and Benjamin Morrison both injured. Well, strength and conditioning has nothing to do with if, you know, if, if you're going to have a stress fracture in your foot, you know, from a lingering Leonard injury that started off in your ankle. Yeah. And if you, if you injure your shoulder, you know, again, like you come down on your shoulder, whatever the injury happens to be, there's nothing strength and conditioning can do to, to help that 
as well. And injury is an injury. Injuries are going to happen, and it's not all on the strength program. And I did see that that uh, you know Salty may have been trying to troll us with that anyway, and, and you know just get you know kind of a uh, a hot take discussion going. But I'm going no, no, I'm not pinning anything on strength and conditioning when you've got the specific kind of injuries that you've got right there. It's it's more along the lines of you know, hamstrings and, you know, pulls and things like that, that's when it's a little bit more of a concern. But, but even then, you know, a lot of it is still specific to the player. You know, it's like you've got certain guys who are a little bit tighter than others and you just have to kind of. I have strong bones. Strong bones? Dense bones? Strong, dense ligaments, bones. I'm knocking on wood right now, but. Dense bones? Not like All my right. mother. She's breaking everything. <laughs> when your father's starting to break down as well. Uh, like I have issues going on. I hurt my back last week. No, no, wasn't it? You hurt your back a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. It's the, is yours it, better now? it yeah. is. I hope you weren't laughing at me or it's karma for you. Oh man. I hurt mine last week and I've already got, I've got herniated discs both in my neck and back. And so I tweaked it last week. And what happens is when I sit on those, fine steel folding chairs over at the cell <laughs> pavilion it doesn't know favors and having two games in three days and i was thinking about it this happened last year as well before we went to the sweet 16 but yesterday i sat down and like i could not i just had shooting pain through my back and i i could not find a position during the game that would allow me to sit down so i've got this back cushion that i take over there with me and what i had to do was put the back cushion on the floor and I actually knelt down for the final three. I had to kneel on one knee to do the game so that I could uh, be comfortable enough to sit there and do it. And so you might see me shuffle around here in a minute if you're watching live because I'm getting to the point where <laughs> it's probably going to happen here as well. Sitting at this 90 degree angle is doing nothing for my back right now, unfortunately. So it doesn't bode well for the flight tomorrow out to Albany. I need to take some sedative, I think, and put myself out. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say, I don't know if you can. I was going to suggest things that are not uh, YouTube appropriate for a way to, to to knock out on a flight. Uh huh. Okay, so after the news of Riley Leonard's foot surgery, Brian Driscoll asked Fighting Irish head coach Marcus Freeman if the quarterback competition is going to evolve Kenny Minchie and C.J. Carr, and here is the response. Well, I think, Driscoll, that you, you, every day you, you evaluate and say, hey, is there a way to put some pressure on all of them? I don't want anybody getting comfortable. Steve, you know, I don't want Steve to go here. I'm the one, and, and I'm not worried about Kenny and, and C.J. He shouldn't be worried about him. He should be worried about Steve, but at the same point, I don't want him comfortable. You don't want anybody comfortable in the position they're in. You want uh, that, 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 that competition, that adversity to, to really get those guys to thrive. So, um, no, this is just for today, you know, and, and I'm sure it'll probably be for the next practice. But if there's ways to create competition, we, we would definitely do it. All right, Jess. So you heard Marcus Freeman there. What do you think? So this is the good old argument that we kind of had, you know, when a few weeks ago. Is there a real quarterback competition for Riley Leonard against the rest of the field? And what we talked about is that you create competition every day. Even if there is not, you know, some sort of quote unquote competition for QB1, you still have guys pushing each other every day to be the best version of themselves. And really, that's kind of what Marcus Freeman you know, was talking about. I don't think he wanted to commit to, you know, it's a competition between these guys and these guys, and he definitely didn't want to commit, you know, because that basically says that Riley Leonard is, is hurt for a prolonged amount of time, right? So, like, by giving one answer, you're kind of giving yourself up to another answer. And so I thought Marcus Freeman handled it kind of how he does all of his other responses, very politically. Um, <laughs> and, and again, you're not going to commit to saying, yes, these guys are in, in a competition, but what you're going to say is, well, Steve is competing with himself every day. Steve and, and everyone in the room is pushing themselves to be better. So yeah. whether or not you believe there's you know a true competition battle or not, I do believe that spots two through three and potentially you know one through three, if something happens to Riley Leonard, are fully up for grabs. You know, either any of those three guys could be one through three. What's going to happen naturally is with Riley Leonard out, the others are all going to get more reps as a result. And 
as every practice goes on and as every rep goes on, they've got film on these guys. They're watching them live. They're going back. They're breaking down film. You're going to start to see more of Kenny Menchie, and you're also going to get to start to see more of C.J. Carr. And what do you have to do when you've got guys in a position group? Ultimately, you have to compare them to each right. other, right? And if – if Especially if, in the new offense. Yeah, and if the guys who weren't getting as many opportunities when Riley Leonard was out there are all of a sudden making plays and making plays at you know the same ability or better as the other guys – who they're around, they're going to catch your eye, and it's called meritocracy. And if the you know if 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 uh, the C team guy is suddenly performing better than the B team guy because the C team guy is getting more reps and the A team guy's not out there, then he's he's at least theoretically got a chance to move up the food chain, right? Like that's that's just what happens when you get more opportunities. That. You get more opportunities in a situation like this, and all you can do is make the most of your opportunities. And I just think that, you know, natural selection, you're <laughs> like it, you're, you've got opportunity now. And so you can say that it's not necessarily a competition, but every day is a competition, just like Marcus Freeman there said. They want to build more competition every chance they get if possible, right? Yeah, I mean, every practice is an open competition period, and the whole goal is to get better because, I mean, if your third-string quarterback gets better, it's just pushing everyone else above him better, and that goes for every other position on the depth chart. Competition every day is what makes a team tougher and what ultimately is going to make a team better at the end of the day because the ones aren't going to play every play. There's going to be times where a two has to play or maybe a two starts, and now the three has to you know, provide relief to the two because one is out like – all of those guys are going to have to contribute at some point. And so if they can compete every day and get better, it's only going to be better for Notre Dame's team in the long run. <laughs> I'm chuckling because of this comment from DK. <laughs> That's why I start my mornings telling my coworkers they're trash. I am competing against you today. <laughs> you are here to lose to me. And you suck. <laughs> That's just what your life is about. You're losing to me today. You are garbage. And Tommy says two through three question mark. And I think what you're referring to is Angeli Minchie and CJ Carr when you're saying two through three. Yeah, I right? meant to probably say two through four, but um, you know, another I get another part of this that I feel like you have to to bring up is um oh man, sorry, my train of thought just lost me. It's okay. Um, You've got my back on your mind. I know you're concerned about me now. So. <laughs> I am very concerned about you right. and your back. I could see you leaning forward now. So I'm like, I know. I did shift, to... by the way. I don't, you know, I didn't go down a whole lot going from the uh, the chair to the floor, but I am, I am in the kneeling position. Oh, I know what I was going to say. You know, everyone has talked about Notre Dame's quarterback development. That's such a hot topic, right? And so if you have someone like Riley Leonard out and you have two young guys and the complaint is, oh, are we going to go to the portal? Or are we actually going to develop Menchie, Carr, et cetera? I think this is a great time to do that. Like you get more time to develop some of these younger quarterbacks. So, of course, Menchie and Carr are going to be a part of the competition because they're working in to develop just like everyone else in the room, right? And so I, I just think it, it's similar to Benjamin Morrison. Like you don't want guys to get hurt, but it allows an opportunity for, for the backups to get better so when so when the starter does reserve yeah. or return, you have more depth, and if they got to miss more time, you feel comfortable about them stepping in to play. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's just going to get more reps now, and again, because they're getting more reps, you're going to compare them to the other guys, and maybe that 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 begins to affect the depth chart down the road. You, you never want to see anyone get injured, but all this is going to do is give other guys an opportunity to show what they can do now. And for a guy like Kenny Minchie, this is. For Kenny Minchie and Angeli both, this is really a prove it kind of spring to kind of begin to make a move and see exactly what they can do. For CJ Carr, it's still about development, but CJ Carr is also going to get more reps as well. And I was just, where did it go? Someone was saying that the that the blue gold game should basically be just um oh here it is, Josh and Jelly and Minchie taking the majority of steps. I mean, I think that it will be, but at the same time you're going to have an opportunity to get more C.J. Carr in there if there's no Steve Angeli. And as we were talking about yesterday, like Marcus Freeman said when he announced that Riley Leonard is going to be out 
for at least a few weeks that he could come back this spring. I would be in zero rush, and in fact, I would want zero part of Riley Leonard returning to action this spring because of the fact that this is all part of the same lower leg, you know, like from the ankle and into the foot now with a stress fracture in the foot. I would want no part of Riley Leonard coming back this spring. I would There's want no reason. All, all non conti you know, nothing, nothing basically, you know, even that resembles anything live until training camp. Obviously, there will be things that he can do over the summer, you know, throwing and, and those kind of things. But I would want him doing nothing that even resembles anything live until training camp rolls around. And even then, like Vince said, put him in bubble wrap, <laughs> you know. Fred says, I think Notre Dame has to be serious that one of the three can be the starter and not assume anything about Riley Leonard. That's a very good point as well. Like, you know, and again, these guys are all going to, to have a shot to kind of prove that they can be the starter. It begins in the spring. It won't end in the spring, but it begins in the spring. And it's a very good opportunity, again, for these guys to show themselves. And what's going to happen is they're going to put themselves on display in the blue gold game. And then someone's probably going to have a pretty good game. Someone's <laughs> going to have a mediocre game and everyone's oh, going to overreact man. to the guy who has the pretty good game and say that that should be the starter. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a lot of, better. that should be the segment yes. after the blue goal game overreaction Monday. Yes. And let everyone get their overreaction. That's exactly though. what's going to happen. <laughs> like, do we even need to go through the rest of the spring to, to get to that point right now? We know that's going to happen. Right. David, I need to get back to you. David sent this to me in a, a nice message on LinkedIn. When oh, I was David, the guy who sent you the, the thing about the, the, the pelvis, pelvis alignment after my back yeah. was tweaked. You know what, David? I'm going to be in Columbus this weekend. We, You and I will be in further communications. I need to get this back right, this pelvis yeah. realigned, all of it. So yeah. See, I get your message soon. Because of these, the herniated discs that I have, in my in my back, I get these uh, epidural injections with steroid and paint, you know, like the whole thing. But the problem is, I can only get them at certain times of the month. It's not one of those deals where you can uh, rush and just in and roll up and get another an emergency one. epidural injection. <laughs> yeah, unless someone in town's watching and you got my number and you want to, you know, give me one tomorrow morning or even tonight. Like I'd roll in tonight. <laughs> get that that plane's gonna be tough. You 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 need to get uh. You need to get as horizontal as you can tomorrow. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is, is there there's no horizontal on those stupid planes. <laughs> so Tommy says icy option. hot. Icy hot is hot garbage, is what that is. Icy hot's you know like pseudo for the muscles. This is like deep down in the nerve, basically all the way down in my back. It's just it's just not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was, uh, you know, like, hey, you want some ibuprofen? This was yesterday at the game. And I'm like, literally, literally my body just chews up and spits out ibuprofen and acetaminophen <laughs> like it's candy. Man, I got to have the hard stuff, unfortunately. Even that, I took some of the hard stuff last night when I got back because I've got like some, like some, you know, like pain medicine that I kind of, it, it's it's basically my, you know, break glass if necessary medicine if it gets to this. And I took more than I usually do, and it still was doing nothing. The pain was just was just punching right back at it. So it was <laughs> actually it. decent for a while today, and then the more it just I takes spit, one twinge, and then you're you're right back to I the know. beginning. I know. I love the chat. Everyone's going through all the different stuff that they like. I know. <laughs> CBD. I've got some recommendation recommendations of Scotch. Carberry says uh, try some gummies. Volterran. I don't know what Volterran is or how I get a hold of it, but is that like, <laughs> is that like animal painkiller or what exactly? That's that horse tranquilizer. Like. I know. Horse drinks. <laughs> uh, I'll just be, I'll just be unconscious during the game on people, Friday. Well, everyone's telling you thing. stretch. People don't realize you're the stretch encyclopedia. You know, all the stretches. I know the stretches, man. There's like a million and there's, there's <laughs> literally a lot of times they'll help, you know, and then, or at least help alleviate it. And this is just like kicking right back, man. It wants none of the stretches. It wants none of it. I literally had to sleep on the floor last night because it was like the so straight. Part of the surface. Yeah. That's what I do. I have to lay on a hardwood floor for a few, like 10 minutes just to let things realign. Yeah. All right. Well, 
We better move on. Let's move on. Let's move. Nobody want. Nobody. Nobody cares about the labor pains. They just want to see the baby. You know, that's that's what it's all about. No one cares that you did a game yesterday and did the Irish breakdown show. They just that's want right. the results. Kneeling, kneeling. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Marcus Freeman on new offensive coordinator Mike Denbrock's offensive philosophy, talking about using less twelve and thirteen personnel and uh, getting in a little bit more eleven potentially yeah most of it has been 11 um in the spring just be number one is because the injuries to mitch um you know and kevin bauman and, and even Ho uh eli we are we're, we're holding him right in certain areas of practice we're not just saying his load is 100 percent, right we're we're, we're, we're man monitoring his load and so that's why we've been majored in 11 um for the spring you know the the conversations i have with coach denbrock is again we are going to ultimately put the best guys on the field if we get in the fall camp and we feel like our two tight ends give us a better chance to succeed than having three wideouts, then we'll put two tight ends on the field, I'm sure, um, which I've seen him do at Cincinnati when we were down there. So the thing I love about it, it's not about as much this is our scheme, who fits it. His mindset is, okay, who are the best 11, right, or the best 22, and how do we tailor the offense around those guys? And the concepts will stay the same. What we do will, will really stay the same. It's just who is it? Is it a tight end or is it a wideout? All right, so what do you think there, Jess? I, I'm kind of eating this up. I don't know about you. What do you think? Yeah, I'm eating this up and wondering where this Marcus Freeman was last season. Did, was it was it his non-trust and in an inexperienced offensive coordinator and his kind of, you know, we talked about this last year. What was the recipe or the formula? How much input did Marcus Freeman have on the offense? How much did he, you know, input and say, hey, I want to go heavy. I want to run the ball here. I want two tight ends. I want three tight ends. It felt like Notre Dame was forcing its personnel on its scheme rather than kind of, you know, or sorry, forcing its scheme on personnel and not letting, allowing its personnel to, to kind of dictate the offense. And so I love hearing this because this is last season. I, I just, I was asking for it so much of why are we not utilizing our best players and designing plays around our best players? And again, I don't know if that's Marcus Freeman's distrust and experience, whatever it might be. And now you have Mike Denbrock, a guy who knows a little bit more. He's been around the block a few more times. And so it sounds like Marcus Freeman is saying, hey, I trust your evaluation of what we have and what you need to do to the offense to tailor and make us mo you know, most successful. And so it's really refreshing to hear, but it's also frustrating because I wanted that approach last season. Yeah, and I mean, I have been – now, granted, you're still going to – there are going to be some instances where they need to use 12, they need to use 13 – maybe even some 21, even though we we saw 21 kind of dissipate over the course of the season. We saw it sprinkled in a hand few, full of times, uh, you know, now and then. But I, I've kind of always been more along the lines of the Sean McVay Rams approach. You know, they they have always, you know, again, now it's not that they're always in 11, but they're in 11 probably at least 80% of the time, and you just change formations and move guys around in that and, same and personnel you show package. a lot of same motions and movements, right. and I, you know what I mean? You right. keep showing one thing, one thing, and now you show a wrinkle off of it. You know, right. that's kind of exactly. the Sean McVay offense. Exactly. And, you know, and again, there, there are still going to be times where you're going to bring in a second tight end. There might be times, though, as Marcus Freeman was says, said you even take off a tight end you know like how much 10 personnel did we see from Oklahoma State in the second half of that Fiesta Bowl a couple of years ago if you remember that you know so it's like I, I I just I think it's great you know but it also goes to as Marcus Freeman says what is the strength you know what what personnel is your strength and because of the numbers like he was talking about with what they have at tight end this spring tight end is definitely not a strength strength you know, tight end has obviously been more of a strength over the last several years at Notre Dame. Wide receiver has been more of a question mark. So I guess maybe it's made more sense, you know, to get more tight ends on the field, especially when you have a Michael Mayer and, you know, and guys like Mitchell Evans and Eli Raritan, you know, as, as supplementary guys around him. Wide receiver should be more of a strength, though, this year. So looking forward to the chance that maybe we do see more 11 personnel. Yeah, and I like this too because it aligns with Denbrock's overall philosophy. He's a less of a 13, 12 personnel, more of an 11, 10 personnel type. And 
you know, you can still have elite tight ends and run 10, 11 personnel, essentially. Well, probably not 10, but 11 personnel. You, you can definitely still accomplish things because, you know, look at Georgia's offense with Brock Bowers. I know he's not an elite, you know, or maybe not considered to be one of the better um, pass blocking or run blocking, you know, tight ends out there. And a lot of people might say he's just kind of a hybrid of a tight end and a wide receiver, but still – you can come up with concepts that get out of the 11 and 10 personnel that you can still utilize your tight ends, right? Yeah. Like you can still have talented tight ends on the field and allow them to be game changers as well. I just really like this most importantly because I think it's going to allow Notre Dame's athletes, specifically the wide receivers, to be to do more in open space. Absolutely. And it goes along more with Denbrock's overall offense. So I think yeah. it's just really good that that's naturally how it's drifting. Yeah. And I mean, and again – it's even with Tommy Reese, you know, between Reese and Jared Parker, you're still talking, you know, even with Reese, you're still talking about a, a fairly inexperienced offensive coordinator, one who's very smart and has been around some interesting concepts in his past, but he was still very, you know, in the very early stages of implementing it. And obviously Jared Parker was as well. Whereas with Mike Denbrock, you've got a guy who has kind of gone through his experimental phase and figured out what works and what doesn't works and what he likes and what he doesn't like. And we'll be able to implement, I think a whole lot more, you know, he'll have a better grasp of, of uh, exactly what it's going to take for these guys. So I like that. Continue to get a lot of interesting um, recommendations. I like, you know, from Tommy change your socks spoken like a true Marine, <laughs> you know, like it, it, it's your socks. That's the problem. You know, you're letting your socks get too wet when you're out there in the field in your boots DK, I mean, he's going with the very hard stuff. She don't mind. She don't mind cocaine. Uh, ND Sailor, take two Tylenol, two ibuprofen together. It'll help. Well, maybe if I chased it with a fifth of vodka, it would help. But <laughs> other than that. Uh, but David, the guy with some real nose says if you just address the symptoms pain you will not address the real problem okay usually when pain happens it's it's the the that group is overcompensating in trying to uh function for whatever is actually hurt and so that's probably that's i think what he's saying is like if you have pain it's a response to someone else you know trying to fix what else is going on in the body so right i think i got to go with tommy i think you just need to change some socks <laughs> Uh, Michael says, buy some Jordans. Okay. Let's see if that helps. I don't know. I've tried a lot of different kinds of shoes. It's the sh I don't know if it's the shoes, though. Josh wants to know if we're going to discuss the kickoff rule change and the hip drop, drop tackle being banned. Let's get into that right now. We've had a few people asking about that. So NFL owners have approved the big change to the league's kickoff, and it's going to go into effect this upcoming season. The new format is taken from the XFL, and it's meant to reduce high-speed collisions and concussion rates. So here's what it is. Kickers will continue to kick off from their own 35-yard line, but the other 10 players on the kickoff team are going to line up at the receiving team's 40-yard line. At least nine members of the return team have to line up in a setup zone between their own 35 and 30-yard lines, and up to two returners can line up deep in the landing zone between the goal line and the 20. So no one other than the kicker and returners can move until the ball hits the ground or hits a player inside the landing zone. Touchbacks will be marked at the 30 and no fair catches are allowed. This is going to be the uh, only season they're going to use it. They're going to use it in 2024 and then they are going to reevaluate it afterwards. So... What do you think? Do you buy or sell this kickoff change? I have. I'm just doing my my duties here. Go ahead okay. and pull this on to the screen if you can. Okay. Got the screenshot for us. Oh, um, there we go. Henry's buying. I think Henry's buying. Yeah, Henry's buying. So this is just a visual representation for anyone that's watching. Might have to blow um, it up a little bit. Uh. I, I was saying this... people watching might have to blow it up. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It. Yeah. That's um, okay. But yeah, so this is kind of just a visual representation um, of what you were just going through. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's what the XFL has been, you know, basically experimenting with. And 
you know, a lot of people are ultimately going to, you know, say sell right off the bat. But the reason why I buy this is because I'm tired of just seeing kickers blast it through the end zone. If we're going to have a kickoff, at least have got give give the other team a chance to return it. Allow it to be an actual play in the game instead of just seeing, again, kickers blast it 10 yards through the back of the end zone. And it's just another wasted play, right? Like if, if you're going to have this a part of the game, it needs to be functional. You need guys to actually return it and have a chance at return it, or just get rid of kickoff completely. Just give the ball to the other team as soon as they score. The only kicking that you would need are punts and field goals. Just completely eliminate you know, the kickoff if guys are just going to send it through the back of the end zone every time. So I, as a fan, appreciate the effort to find a way to get the action back in the game and actually utilize you know, a, a kickoff, a true kickoff. Yes, and someone is asking about the onsides. We'll get to that in a minute because that's kind of a special. And I kind of I meant to have the rules on that onside. Basically, you can request it. I think twice a game or something like that. The onside part of it. Does that sound right? <laughs> I don't. I the only thing that would suck is you would very clear. I think the element of surprise would be completely gone. Well, yeah, you're going to lose the element of surprise. That's what's stupid about it. Um, I'm looking at all this different data and I know that there was something in there about you you can you can basically you can request an onside kick basically but like you said you're going to completely lose the surprise. When I first heard of this I was like are you kidding you know what are they doing they're really going to to do this they're I, I do like it I, I do like the fact that they're not just going to say this is what the rule is going to be we're going to do it forever. They're going to try it for a year and they're they're either going to tweak it or get rid of it and go back to the old thing. I still haven't seen a ton of data that says like they're like I watch a lot of football, both NFL and college. Do guys, you know, get get hurt on kickoffs and kickoff returns? Of course. But they also get hurt on a lot of other plays that have nothing to do with kickoffs. It is an impact game. And I I guess I appreciate the fact that because of all the modern science and technology and everything else, you do have guys who are bigger, faster, and stronger than ever before, and they are trucking each other at like 20 to 25 plus miles an hour, you know, and they're trying to reduce concussions. They're trying to reduce serious injuries that they say are occurring on these plays. So, and and just kind of watching how the XFL did it. I mean, you're basically talking about a, a you know a couple of stationary lines. The guy receives the kick, and then he runs through it. So I don't have a major issue. It's kind of like an old school you know, roundabout like, Oklahoma drill. Yeah, in some I mean, sense. the game has evolved over time. They, they used to wear no pads, then they wore leather helmets, and they still wore no face masks for a long time. And you know, they didn't have mouthpieces, and guys bit chunks of their tongue off because they weren't wearing mouthpieces back in the day you know they've alleviated some of that rules change over time and you know just the way that they do things have changed over time so i don't have a major <laughs> issue with it i will be interested to see you know over the course of the season how it works do you think that if it it works in the nfl it's eventually coming to college football as well 100 percent. the brain is even less developed at that age and so if there is going to be success at the NFL level, they are definitely going to implement it at the college level for safety. DK, on it as always. He says people get injured sitting in chairs doing podcasts. That's, I mean, come on. Are they going to change the rules of podcasts? That's what I want to know. Are they going to change the rules of broadcasts? That's what I want to know. Oh, Carberry is going back to that. They make millions. They know what the risk is. Yeah, but I mean, you know, they put in targeting rules. I mean, the Again, the rules change over time. Well, and it's Just because it would they're be making millions doesn't mean you want to get your head bashed in and have a concussion and, and die at 58 because you've got CTE, <laughs> right? I it mean, would just be a disservice as as we continue to ad advance as a as a as a society, you know, technologically, uh, laboratory studies, etc. It'd be a disservice to the NFL to gain all this information and not apply it and try to implement as much player safety as possible. You know, a lot of people are saying, oh, it's just going to end up being flag football at some point. That's just not true. The NFL is going to draw a line of 
there there are stuff that is you know you know to, to Carberry's point not but not as dramatic they know that there are certain risks but it's the NFL's job to kind of mitigate those borderline risky stuff that are still controllable right and so yeah. as we continue to get smarter I still believe there are certain things on the table for the NFL to continue to admit but there are certain things that are untouchable it is always going to be a tackle sport well look we were talking with Bryce Young the Notre Dame freshman freshman defensive lineman a few weeks ago when we got to talk to the early enrollees over there at Notre Dame. The guy didn't start playing football until like eighth or ninth grade. He, and he's the son of an NFL Hall of Famer. And the reason was because, you know, his dad didn't want him taking all these hits to the head, basically. You know, so like guys who have played the game, they know, you know, they're they're educated about this stuff so you know just because they're making millions of dollars doesn't mean that that uh, there's not a high amount of risk that they're putting their bodies at by being out there on the field I think that this can still be an entertaining play just because they're changing the rules of the kickoff I don't you know I don't I don't think that it that 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 takes away some of the excitement of it they're just trying to take out the impact you know the high impact of it and try to reduce concussions. So I think that's the biggest thing. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame women's basketball head coach Neil Ivey said after yesterday's win over Ole Miss that Sonia Citron is not talked about enough. So Jess, Citron is blank. Sonia Citron is a difference maker. Without no, without Sonia Citron, Notre Dame is not on a 10-game running streak or winning streak. They are not playing defense at the high level that they are. They are not making the the their offense and the the assist ratio isn't as near as good as it would be without Sonia Citron. Hannah Hidalgo cannot pull the weight of the rest of the team behind her, and for that reason, to me, Sonia Citron is a difference maker. Notre Dame needs her to perform well, just like they need Hannah Hidalgo to perform well at a high level, right? So, like right now on on this team, I think you have three difference makers, and it's very obvious who they are. It's Hannah Hidalgo, Sonia Citron. And um, Maddie Westbelt, Anna DeWolf, X the big factor. three. They're calling them the big three all the, the big time three. now. <laughs> but if Anna DeWolf, right. Anna DeWolf isn't a difference maker, she is an X factor. If she gets hot, right. she's the type of team where it's it's you're going to stand no chance. Like if DeWolf goes for 15 and has four threes, it, it's going to be a long day to beat Notre Dame. So she's an X factor. She's not really a difference maker. She's an X factor. And of course, you know with Natalia Marshall playing now due to injuries. She just she needs to be the presence uh, defensively, right? And, and again, that's another X factor. So I think you have three difference makers on this team, and and Sonia Citron is definitely one of them. And she's going to be the reason why Notre Dame can continue to make this run in the tournament. I mean, you're right. I mean, where Notre Dame is right now, entering Sweet 16 territory, and hopefully moving on, you know, continuing to move on. From there, Anna DeWolf, because the reason they went out and got her was because she was a three-point shooter. I think it was 78 three points, three pointers that she hit at Fordham last year. She's she's not quite hitting half of her scoring average from a year ago, but she's obviously not asked to do the same kind of thing when she was at Fordham. She's got other, you know, players around her who are at a different level. You know, from Anna DeWolf, really all you need, like if she can just hit two to three timely threes. A game. That's really what you want from her. Just like really just like stopping a run or basically stopping or igniting a run for Notre Dame. Just game momentum threes is really what Anna DeWolf is about. You know, especially when you have Hidalgo and Citron working in transition, it's a nice kick out to the corner and Anna DeWolf is there. Yes. My answer to Sonia Citron is blank is criminally underrated. She was the number eight scorer in the ACC. She has the number seven, she has the seventh best field goal percentage, overall field goal percentage in the ACC. As a guard, she has the seventh best field goal percentage in the ACC. I mean, it's basically all forwards and centers in front of her in terms of field goal percentage. Led the ACC in free throw percentage, eighth in steals, number 23 in block shots, again, as a guard, number five in minutes played, right behind a doggo. She's 44th in the nation in minutes played this season. And the leader in, you know, in terms of floor burns and bruises and, you know, diving for (laughs) loose balls and doing the dirty work. Yeah. Effort. And and as David says, defense as well. She's a, again, criminally underrated just in terms of the defense that she provides. So 
I think that uh, I think she is very, very underrated. She should have been a first team all ACC performer. Again, just looking at those stats and where she ranked in the ACC. But I, I think, you know, she kind of got overshadowed a little bit. And, you know, and, and that knocked her down to the second team along with Maddie Westfeld. But, you know, I think that they both deserve to be on the first team. And when you look at where this team is right now, I think if you, if you, you know, redid the voting for a lot of this stuff, they all would have been, including Neil Ivy, a little bit higher in some of that stuff. So fill in the blank. UConn head coach Gino Ariema calling Husky guard Paige Beckers the best player in America. Is blank. Is homerism. It's what you do <laughs> as a head coach when your team is in the Sweet 16. You are the head coach of UConn, one of the nations, you know, considered one of the best programs, if not the best program over the last two decades. Like, you're UConn. You crank out the best players in the nation. You crank out some of the best teams in the nation. And Paige dropped 32 in a very crucial game that they needed to, to move on to the Sweet 16. And so, of course, after – you know, just like I, I, if Hannah Hidalgo had that some type of performance against Ole Miss and they needed to rely on her and lean on her a little bit more, um, I would, I'm would, i sure she would have said the same thing in the post-game press conference that, you know, Hannah Hidalgo is one of the best players in the country. So it's homerism. It's expected. Do I necessarily believe it? I mean, yeah, she's up there, but she's not the best player in the nation, right? And so – and that's that's what's going to be – to me, the fun part of getting into the, the on both sides of the men's and women's bracket into these final 16 games or sorry, final eight games, final 16 teams is you're truly going to see who some of the nation's best players are, because this is where best players take over. Right. Like on good teams, this is where you shine. This is where, you know, this is what gets you those last second wins or, you know, the, the ability to go ISO when the team needs you the most like. This is where the great players show up. So I'm really excited to see on this stage kind of we as the fans can determine for ourselves who are the best players. I just felt like I realize as a head coach, you got to you got to trumpet your own players and you got to prop them up and all that kind of stuff. But it, I, it, it felt like with all the hoopla going on with Caitlin Clark and then the article that came out last week about Caitlin Clark, the, you know, the, the right Thompson um you know, long, long form article that came out at ESPN.com. And it mentions that Gino Ariema didn't recruit, recruit Caitlin Clark. You know, it felt like this was, was one of those shots, you know, by Gino Ariema, because, you know, when everybody's talking about somebody else, Gino's got to make it about Gino and Yukon. He's got to find a way no matter what, like anytime Muffet McGraw used to open her mouth when she was a head coach, she didn't even have to mention Gino and Gino was going to shoot back and, you know, fire back whatever, because a narcissist is going to narcissist basically. And Paige Beckers was the best player in the nation in the women's game two years ago. And she was voted named the best player in the nation two years ago, but she's not now. Caitlin Clark leads the nation in both scoring and assists. She also leads the nation in three point attempts, nearly 500 three point attempts of this season. And she also shoots at a 38% clip, which for that many attempts is still a very respectable clip. She's only 2% away from 40% leading the nation in attempts. So you're going to see both of them. You know, I mentioned this at the start of the show. UConn and Paige Beckers are going to be in Albany, New York this weekend. Caitlin Clark is going to be in that same region. Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith are also in that same region with those teams. And Juju Watkins and USC are also in that same region. You've got two regions that are going to be out there. So all those players are on one side. And then you've got Hannah Hidalgo, Sonia Citron, Maddie Westbelt, and Notre Dame, along with, with uh, Camilla Cardoso and, you know, Don Staley squad in, in South Carolina over there. There's, you know, there's a few more stars on the other side, but you're I mean, there's a lot of talent that's going to be out there in Albany between those, the Albany one and Albany two regions this weekend. Um, but, you know, again, to answer the question, Paige Beckers is a great player, but she's not the best player in the game right now. It's Caitlin Clark, and there's not an argument. What about the men's bracket, Jess? Do you have a uh, a men's team that lost during the first weekend of March Madness that wrecked your bracket the most? Um, During the first weekend? I would say, do, 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 do. I want to say it was Kentucky because I think that was 
kind of, you know, the one that got a lot of people. Um, but I don't know, like, if any – I didn't have Kentucky going as far. Like, I kind of had them tapering off. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anyone else – kind of big upset wise that screwed me. I mean, BYU kind of got me a little bit when, um, what is it? Does dust Duskany beat them? Um, other than that, no, I think it was. Mine's Kansas. It, I'll just say Kansas because <laughs> I knew that Kansas wasn't going to go anywhere, but I, 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 I said this when I did my brackets last week, I did the reverse psychology you know, like, okay, Kansas isn't expected to do anything, so maybe they'll actually make a little bit of a run. Well, that Kansas did get but me. But I've actually too. got a lot of chalk. I mean, I've got Houston, I've got UConn, I, I don't have Purdue. I think I had Kansas beating Purdue, but I've got Illinois, I've got Iowa State. I've got a lot of teams that are still in it right now. I just I didn't I didn't have Kansas winning at all, but I had them going to the final four. But that's that's my I win. had uh Kentucky and Kansas also. Kansas got me pretty good because I had them. I didn't. I had Gonzaga losing in the f- first round, and so I had Kansas not playing Gonzaga in the second round, and that largely kind of played into why I thought Kansas would move on um, to the Sweet yeah. Sixteen. I I don't know if I told you this. I at the beginning of the tournament, I put twenty five dollars on my Final Four team, who I thought would make it to the Final Four, and those it's still intact. My Final Four team, really, all, all four. All four are still intact. Twenty-five dollars to win three thousand. So if they can make it through this weekend, I would be ecstatic. I have Houston, Purdue, or no, Houston, Connecticut, North Carolina, and Tennessee. I feel the best about Connecticut and North Carolina. I don't feel great about Tennessee and Houston right now. Yeah. Uh, a couple, a couple comments. Coming in, David was asking about Caitlin Clark. She was a uh, I don't know, but I don't know if it was silent or not. But she, like in that Wright Thompson article at ESPN.com, she was committed to Notre Dame. And in the article, it talks about how she called Muffet McGraw to tell her after she had committed that she was going to sign with Iowa instead. So her family, her entire family, she she went to a Catholic high school. You know, like everyone in the school basically expected like thought that she was going to go to Notre Dame, but she ended up going to Iowa instead. So uh, that was that. And then Brad asking about the injuries and if it reflects on Lauren Lando. Again, like there's nothing, we don't know exactly what the shoulder injury is, but if Benjamin Morrison went up and came down and popped the shoulder socket, which I did both, you know, to, to my left playing baseball in high school and to my right wrestling in high school, you know, just like the way you jam your shoulder socket when you come down and that's, you know, that's what, you know, causes that separation. And then what happens with the separation, the, the, the bone in your shoulder, you know, in that shoulder joint comes out and it lacerates the labrum, you know, and then from there, you, you know, you have whatever degree of tear and that's, that's how, you know, the, both the pain inside, you know, that, that labrum slash socket and and whatever else. So my point is there's nothing Lauren Lando could have done about, or any other strength coach could do about something like that. It, you know, you're playing football. If you come down, you pop it and it comes out of socket. There's nothing a strength coach can do about that. Just like there's nothing a strength coach can do about a stress fracture developing in a guy's foot who already had an injury, you know, in a plate in that foot when he came in to Notre Dame. It's just, very unfortunate injuries happen, but but both of those things are are things that cannot be controlled by the strength coach. Did you hear what happened to Nolan <laughs> Ziggler? You're doing the around the world the... there. Oh, yeah, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Um, I, I mean, I know the Nolan Ziggler story, but it's not something. I don't know if it's you know something is being reported out there, but it's not something we're going to talk about here. So. That's from the top down. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about that. We've made it almost an hour in rapid fire. Did you know that? Have we really? Yeah. Man, we've been going for a while. All right. Do you have a Cinderella team that's still alive in your bracket? I have none. Uh, like you were all in on NC You know State. who it's going to be. I thought that the NC State magic was going to die after I'm that ACC stay. run. But here they are in the Sweet Six. I've made that, some good coin on NC State on I this run. 
I've taken their money line in like four straight games ever going back to like the ACC semifinals. It started with Virginia. Then it was North Carolina. Then it was their first round game. Then it was their second round game. And they've been plus money line every game. And I have taken that plus money line every game. Hottest team in the country. Most confidence. Their big man is dominating. And they're fun to watch. They're, they are definitely the Cinderella team. And I'm glad I have them losing. The, this is It's funny. This is where the, the show stops for me, though. I don't have them going past the Sweet 16. Yeah. This could be where – who are they playing? Do you remember off the top of your head? I was just um, looking at the back earlier. I want to say – it is another low rated. It's no, not do. Come on. Who is it? Marquette. 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 Yep. That should be a good game, actually. Just the way Marquette's played and the way NC State have played. So. Yeah. And Marquette's got a couple of guys who are coming back from recent injuries, right? Like they got some of their, one of their key players just as the tournament started. Um, I don't know what, what Ziegler did at Central Michigan, but there was nothing that he did here at Notre Dame that, that would I would term him a bad influence. So I have no idea what happened up at Central Michigan, but I don't think we need to. He's gone. He's moved on. So there's there's really no reason to, to kind of beat on that at all. Well, I think that's going to do it. You know, like I said, I don't have any Cinderella's, unfortunately. Like I thought I might have had one kind of hanging around. I was saying last week my uh, – my um my bracket is very chalky and i actually i forgot did you do a women's bracket in our bracket challenge yes i sure did i had mine all set up and then i forgot i forgot to make my picks in the women's i was looking i was like how do i have zero points i forgot to go through and, and make my picks i started and then i got distracted and went and did something else and then i came back and i'm like are you kidding me i didn't make any picks <laughs> Did I tell you that I, I I placed a, a little wager on the women's team to win it all? Did you? How much? That was so I did I did a bet on each side, the men's side and the women's side. I told you about the final four bet that I did. The only reason I did it is because I had a boost. And so you know me, like I try to get the most value out of the boost, right? And so I boosted Notre Dame women's to win the national championship and twenty five dollars wins two thousand. So both of those are still alive. I have my final four on the men's side and clearly the women's. Um, are still together. I just really like the women's right now because of the way they're playing defense. Like it's incredible. And, and, and especially in the you, tournament. I've been telling you for a while. play it's about good defense, defense, baby. Yep. And to have the offensive firepower still at the other end, all yep. they got to worry about is these these refs. They need to get the, whi the, the whistles out of their mouth and let these teams play. I yeah. think that, that's, that's, that's a little concerning. Thing. That's what I was saying that last night. I'm, I'm pretty disappointed in the type of fouls these officials are calling in the NCAA tournament with the stakes as high as they are right now, you got to get away from these garbage little ticky tack fouls. There's too much of it all the way around. Like it, you're doing nobody any favors and you're not helping anyone who's actually tuning in to watch the games and wants to see, you know, wants to be entertained basically watching the games. You're not helping anything. I uh, I know this, I don't want to get too drug out here, but this is the last comment I have. And I know not, not a lot of people care about the NBA and that's fine. But ever since the all-star <laughs> break, go. <laughs> Adam Silver may, I guess, I, I guess told referees, Hey, stop calling the game so tight. We don't want to see all these fouls. It's what the women need to do in the tournament. Just, you they know, let the players play. We're here yeah. to see, like I we, we were talking about, Juju Watkins, Caitlin Clark, Hannah Hidalgo, you know, Paige Bukers, all these great players are going to be in the arena. That's what we want to see. We want to see the players play. We don't want to see the referees taking over the show. Concur. Concur, Jess. Let's end it on that. All right. So I'm going to be traveling to Albany tomorrow. I'll be in Albany on Thursday, though, and uh, I'll have my end of the show from there. Looking forward to that. And then, of course, we've got a basketball game on Friday. It's looking like no rapid fire show on Friday this week because we've got a 2.30 game and um, Vince is already off and, you know, just everything, you know, so with all the scheduling and stuff like that, most likely. Good Friday not, as well. Come on. Oh, that's right. I forgot. That's it's. Your mom reminded me that that Sunday is Easter, and that's like yes, totally off my radar with with all the basketball and everything else going on.
right now. Yes. So, so this Friday is Good Friday. We can all reflect and be grateful together. We are. Vince and I have toyed with the idea of maybe a a, uh, a quick Saturday show if the women make it to the Elite Eight. Like if an they emergency win show on Friday, we might do a Saturday show if people are interested. So um, maybe I'll put a poll up on the Champions Lounge and see who would be interested in a Saturday show. So Jesse could potentially be in on that as well. You're welcome, Father David. I know my <laughs> holidays that I am off work and paid. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today. We appreciate you as always hit that like button and uh, don't just subscribe, but if you're, you know, on your podcast platforms, whether it's Spotify or Apple playing the podcasts is very important. These just, days. you know, a, a lot of offices downloads. have speakers and everything. Just connect the podcast to your Bluetooth speaker at work. That's all you got to do. Let it play on replay, repeat, and the whole office will love you for dropping knowledge on the office. That's right. That's right. See how much knowledge we got? That's the way to do it. <laughs> all right. Thanks as always. We will talk to you later on IB Nation Sports Talk.